Hey guys, Bailey here. I'm super pumped for today's video because we're gonna be talking all about planning a through hike with a dog. Some people nerd out on gear and weight and being UL. Others nerd out on the planning process. I really nerd out on how to make my through hikes better with my dogs. So if you don't know, I attempted to through hike the Colorado Trail with my dogs in 2018 and ended up sending them home at Kenosha Pass because things just didn't go well. I was really inexperienced at the time. Was not bueno. I was able to get back out last year and successfully through hike a 750 mile route known as the San Luis Loop with the dogs. And that was a big game changer. Like I really learned a whole bunch. You know, I was happy to make it to the end, but things still weren't 100% perfect. And so I've been doing a ton of planning and a ton of research to make sure that our upcoming through hike for the summer will run as smooth as possible. So I do want to mention real quick that I am approaching this video from my perspective of what I'm taking into consideration when planning a through hike with my dogs. So there's a couple things that I'm not really going to talk about in depth because, you know, I already know that my dogs can sleep in a tent. I already know that they're not going to chase grizzly bears or moose. You know, there's certain things that if you have not done a lot of backpacking with your dogs, then you might want to kind of take some of those things into consideration. However, if you do have any specific questions about things that I haven't addressed, I would be more than happy to answer those down in the comments. And then you might also want to consider subscribing to my channel so that way you can see when future videos come out on other topics like that that I don't necessarily discuss here. And then the last thing is kind of going along with that is obviously I have gained most of my knowledge just from getting out there and doing it. Like, again, this is what I am doing, but this might not work for everyone. I definitely don't know everything, you know, different dogs have different needs. You may have different needs. You may be hiking in a different place. You know, the AT East Coast and even the PCT are going to be different than the CDT. So do keep that in mind as well. Okay, so the first major thing that I really took into consideration when planning this upcoming Continental Divide Trail through hike with my dogs was making sure that they got the go-ahead from the vet. So in the past, I haven't actually had my dogs evaluated by a veterinarian before attempting to through hike. And I felt pretty good about that just because I have experience in the vet care industry. And I knew that my dogs are pretty fit. Because this trip is going to be about four times as long as the San Luis Loop and we're gonna be out there much longer, as well as the fact that my dogs are going to be eight years old when we start this trek, which is not young, especially for Prima. I wanted to make sure that I got the go ahead and the thumbs up before we went out on the trail. It also was a really great opportunity to ask some questions that I had from a veterinary professional. So when I took my dogs into their vet appointment, I made a whole list of questions that I wanted to ask about things that I had been heavily researching. So I asked about some foot care tips, I asked about supplements, I asked about food, I asked about their structure, about if they could send any meds with me, were there any procedures they needed to have done, and everything that I could ask. And my vet was really awesome and you know, offered to like reach out to other people and like the mushing industry and stuff like that for me. So that's definitely a good thing to consider just to make sure that your dogs are healthy enough to attempt a through hike. And this is definitely important if you have a really young dog that might you know, be below two years old, an older dog, or if you're just not familiar with your dog's structure and confirmation and knowing how to tell if they're going to actually be fit enough to attempt a through hike. Of course, along with that, both my dogs are actually going in tomorrow when this video is published to have their teeth cleaned and to have a couple other small procedures done. And while this definitely it really hurts my pocketbook, especially since I'm trying to save for the CDT, I know it's really important because I know that my dogs will feel better and that when we leave, they'll be on their A game and that I'll be able to know when we're on trail that if something else goes wrong, I can rule out some of those things and know that we're at least starting with a clean slate. So the second major thing that I've really been considering with my CDT through hike planning has been foot care and training. So I have to say for me, physically conditioning my dogs has not been as high of a priority as their feet have been. So I know that my dogs are pretty good at going from couch potato to hiker, and I know that I'm planning on starting very slow, and I'm also making a conscious effort to not exercise without my dogs, that way we're starting on the same page. So I really am not as worried about that side. I'm more worried about their feet because historically, on my past two through hikes with them, that has been the much bigger issue. One of the biggest reasons I sent them home on the Colorado Trail was because of sore feet, and that is definitely something that we battled the whole entire way on the San Luis Loop. So I've been trying really hard to do a lot of different research into foot care, and I did just recently make a video about this that you can check out here. If you want like more in depth, I'm not gonna go through because I'm trying to keep this you know, concise. 
But the main thing is that I'm trying really hard to walk them on gravel, pavement, take them to the beach and walk them in all the really rocky areas to kind of start toughening up their feet. I've basically created like a schedule with like hiking goals to make sure that we're getting out consistently and trying to like build up over time because I am pretty busy and it gets pretty busy with the planning process and you know quitting my job and stuff. So trying to make sure to get out there consistently every day. The other thing is I've been looking into products like Tough Feet and Musher Secret. So I'll probably start using some of those as we get closer to help you know, get their feet ready to go. And then the other main thing is making sure to clip their nails. So I Dremel their nails at least once a week you know, there's a lot of dogs that their nails wear down when they're walking every day. A lot of people say you don't need nail clippers on the trail. That has not been my experience with my own personal dogs. When we finished the San Luis Loop, their nails were the longest that they've ever been in their whole life. And that certainly contributed to some of the problems that we're having because it can change their foot shape and also can cause rubbing in the booties and make the booties not sit right on their feet if you do use booties. So that's something to consider as well. So the next thing that makes me a little panicky is the food front. So I'm not quite as worried about this as I am about their feet, but it's still a really important consideration to me. Fortunately for me, because I've done, you know, another through hike, I kind of have an estimate on how many calories per day my dogs need. So I basically took how much I was feeding them and converted that to kcals and then because i'm switching dog foods this year then i could convert back to find out how much i need to feed so i've learned that prima is going to need at least 4,000 kilocalories per day and skittles will probably need about a thousand kilocalories per day that's going to be my base and then if these become very lean then i'm definitely going to boost that up because of that i'm going to be switching from pure and pro plan sport that i've been using in the past to the anook shook 3032 dog food so this is the highest calorie dog food on the market that you can buy that is afco approved it's based out of canada but you can order it through Chewy. So that's what I'm planning to do is order a bag to the different towns we're hiking through and then rebag it and send resupply boxes ahead of us. If you are wondering, I will not be using any dehydrated or freeze dried foods. And that's just because from my research, it really is not any lighter on a dry matter basis. So while it is on an as fed, once you add water, you know, of course it's lighter. But if you just look at the calories for just like the powder, it's about the same number as it would be to use a nook shook. And so to me, it's not worth the hassle of dealing with the water situation, of dealing with the higher cost and trying to get it and all that kind of thing. So I do also give my dogs supplements. I give them a glucosamine chondroitin supplement. I try to give them like the advanced type formulas that are higher and that kind of thing just because they are so active. And I'm also now doing an omega-3 supplement. So I'd be like fish oil. And that's just because those are both good preventatives for joint health and because they're going to be moving so much you know i just want to make sure to keep their joints healthy so that five years from now when they're you know definitely both seniors that they can both walk and are basically not crippled from what we're doing so and i do think there's something to that because you know a lot of german shepherds start slowing down when they're about eight or nine and prima honestly is like speeding up she's getting a lot more crazy and so i do think that giving the glucosamine for the past three or four years now has been a good thing for her. So another thing too is of course dog food and all the supplements are pretty heavy. At some point there's just not gonna be a way around that, but I am planning on caching some food in between resupply locations in Wyoming and Montana when we drive to the border. That way at the beginning when we're still getting everything dialed in, when we're still going a little bit slower to get everyone's feet and bodies used to the trail, that I don't have to worry about carrying seven, eight, you know, days of food, I can just do hopefully, you know, three or four or five days of food at a time. So of course the one that everybody asked about would be gear. And so for me, I have to say this is a bit lower priority on my list, but again, that's just because I have this dialed in pretty well already. I'm definitely going with the mentality if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Our gear worked pretty darn well on the San Luis Loop, and so I'm really not planning on changing a whole lot. For our big three, we're gonna be using my Big Agnes Tiger Wall UL2. The dogs will have their Black Diamond throw quilt, and then I'm also probably going to try to get a hold of one of those Gossamer Gear Thin Light sleeping pads just to give Prima a little bit more insulation from the ground. I'm not planning on having Prima wearing a pack currently. You know, if she's doing really well, you know, and we're down in Wyoming, then I might consider having someone mail it to me and maybe she could try wearing it. But I just have found historically that she tends to do better on long distance hikes if I carry everything. And I'm okay with that. And I have, you know, ways around that and I know how to deal with it. 
Other gear that we're bringing include, of course, leashes, collars. I do have special tags that I had made for them saying that we're hiking the CDT. Of course, dog poop bags are a big one for me. I recently upgraded my dog water bowls to Dyneema water bowls, which is probably one of the dumbest things I've spent money on, but it's pretty cool and they're super lightweight, so that's nice. The dogs will have their own water bottle, so I can pour water back in it since we'll be hiking such an arid place. They'll have a toy. First aid gear, I'll bring emergency booties, musher secret, and then as well as nail clippers to keep their nails short and a couple grooming tools for Skittles. As far as like other items that are useful for me and the dogs, I am planning on using the Ursac Opsap combo for food storage. I'll be bringing two Ursacs to be able to fit everyone's food and then I can just roll up one when I don't need it. Again, that's just based off my experience from the San Luis Loop. I had a really hard time fitting more than four days of dog food in one Ursac. Then I'll also be bringing the lightweight hiking umbrella as that was a really, really awesome piece of gear for last year. Things I will not be bringing would be cooling coats. I just don't think they made a big enough difference or were helpful enough in the desert last year. And I will not be bringing an emergency carry harness. If you wanna know why, you can check out the video that I made about that. So some other logistical things that I am going to be keeping in mind would be how to get to and from the trailhead. So I am currently planning on taking a rental car to Montana and then I'll get as close as possible, you know, like Kalispell, Columbia Falls area, and then hopefully find someone to get me a ride to the border from there. And that is nice because I obviously can't fly with the dogs. And then also I will be able to drop off some caches on the way. And then likewise on the flip side, when I finish, you know, I'll probably need to be shuttled from the border and then I'll make it to the next town, either hitching or whatever, where I can get a rental car to drive home. I don't know why I said home. I'm basically a hobo, but you know, you know what I mean. As far as town stops go, I've never had a huge issue hitching with the dog, so I'm really not worried about that. We'll be mailing boxes. So I will, of course, need to plan some of my town stops around post office hours and or mail those to hostels. I'll probably end up staying at hotels just because my dogs like peace and quiet. And so because of that, I need to plan for more expenses and I will probably try to do more Nero's and on trail zeros. That way I can reduce the number of times that I'm staying overnight in town. So when I do stay in town, I can enjoy it and not feel bad about the cost. So on the CDT, there are only three places that are, do not allow dogs. And so out of the Triple Crown trails, it actually is probably the most dog friendly. And that would be the national parks that don't allow dogs. So Glacier National Park, Yellowstone National Park, and Rocky Mountain National Park. I am going to be taking alternates around all three of those. So we're gonna be road walking for the first about two weeks to get around Glacier National Park. And then we'll road walk around Yellowstone. And then it's pretty easy to cut off the 25 mile loop that goes through Rocky Mountain National Park. Along with that, another thing to consider would be the weather and the hiking season. So the CDT is over 3000 miles long if you do the whole thing without any alternates. I am planning on taking at least one, probably two alternates at the least that will cut off miles. So that includes the Super Butte Big Sky cutoff um, from Butte to Yellowstone. And then depending on the weather, I will most likely also have to take the Creed cutoff in Colorado. That brings up another thing is that we wanna make sure that we're through the San Juan Mountains before it really snows and sticks. You know, some years it doesn't stick till November, other years it starts sticking in early October. So we're, you know, crossing our fingers, hopefully it goes well, and then we'll adjust as everything happens. So if you are looking for more tips about training, I'm not gonna talk about that here, but I do have a video on the commands that my dog knows, and I would highly suggest that you guys go check out that video next. <laughs>